Hi, Founder fans. Jason here. And today's anti-founder is General Thomas Gage. And this is the first time I believe I'm actually focusing on an enemy of the American revolutionaries, General Thomas Gage. And to help us is none other than the host of the American Revolution podcast, Michael Troy. Michael, thanks for coming back. Hi, Jason. Pleasure to be here. Okay, so you brought up, hey, why don't you ever talk about the other team? And that's a great idea. And we agree that the best place to start is probably the first major enemy, Thomas, <laughs> almost called him Thomas Troy, Thomas Gage. So let's talk. Uh, we'll, we'll give us a little background on Thomas Gage. Where, where is he? Obviously from England, but where was he when the revolution breaks out? Yeah, like most British officers, he came from a good family aristocracy. He was the uh, second son of a Viscount, which is common for British officers. The first son gets the uh, landed title, and the second son has to go join the army. Uh, so he started a career. He's about, I don't know, 15 years older than Washington. So he got a little bit earlier start in the military. Uh, he was old enough to fight as an officer in the War of Austria in succession. And um, was also present at the Battle of Culloden. If anyone's familiar with Scottish history, that's a big one. Interesting. Um, then he headed over to North America with General Braddock in 1755. And Captain Thomas Gage uh, was heading up Braddock Road to Fort Duquesne. And he met colonial Captain George Washington, who was on that same mission uh, to take Fort Duquesne from the French. That's fascinating. I had no idea. I did not realize he was on Braddock's, um, the, the word escapes me, uh, uh, expedition. Yes. Yes. He was one of Braddock's officers. A whole lot of actually um, uh, generals uh, were on that expedition. You know, um, Charles Lee, Horatio Gates. Um, really? Uh, I want to say, were... uh, uh, not Richardson. Uh, oh, man. It's... Adam Stevens. Adam Stevens. Thank you. Yes. You read my uh, mind. Um, so even, anyway. Uh, yeah, Daniel Boone and Daniel Morgan were actually on those as kids, as Wagoners, volunteers. Yeah, no, it's an extraordinarily underrated part of the revolution. Next time you're back, we'll focus on Braddock. How about that? Uh, because it, it was a very a learning experience for how many future generals and colonels and brigadiers uh, for the American Revolution. But as yeah. for Gage, does he remain in the United States after that? Yeah, he goes on to fight in the French and Indian War, as it's called over here, uh, part of the Seven Years' War uh, that Britain was fighting with France. Uh, he uh, is working with, um, oh, what's his name? Uh, the, the British commander in America at the time. We're losing uh, everyone's name today. <laughs> I'm with this. Um, Amherst. Uh, oh, yes, Amherst. Jeffrey Amherst, certainly. Um, he's He's serving under Jeffrey Amherst. Um, he actually doesn't do very well in the war. He is criticized for being a little too timid and not being aggressive enough in his attacks and holding back a bit in some areas that he thought was too dangerous to bring his army into. So he, he, he kind of takes a hit for that. But Amherst recognizes that he's a really good administrator. And when Amherst is ready to head back to England at the end of the war, uh, Gage takes over command of the North American military. And he is uh, basically running things during uh, Pontiac's rebellion. And um, in the more than a decade, almost two decades leading up to the American Revolution, decade and a half, I guess, um, he is the military commander in North America. So he's responsible for all of the colonies, including Canada and uh, that area up there and, and parts of the Caribbean. So he is overseeing the very soldiers that many a colonial were not happy were still hanging around in the colonies. Yeah, and in truth, during peacetime, there weren't that many. You're, we're talking about a few regiments. It's not a, a, a huge army. It was um, low on the list of complaints, but it was there. <laughs> 
Oh, yeah. Well, it, you know, it became a big issue, especially when the violence started rising up. Engage deployed a couple of regiments to Boston, um, which ended up with the Boston Massacre. Uh, did not, you know, go over particularly well. Um, <laughs> Famously. So, Gage had to kind of clean up that mess. He was operating out of New York by this time. That's where he, his main headquarters was. But um, he was responsible for deploying the, the two regiments to Boston, which got, got into all that trouble. Um, and yeah, he was basically overseeing the British Army during this period of protest and mob violence and, and all that sort of thing. Right. And then, uh, you know, and, uh, Hutchinson is, becomes governor of Massachusetts, but he is fairly famously in these circles replaced by Gage. Uh, yeah, Thomas Hutchinson is the governor of Massachusetts, uh, who he is actually a Massachusetts native, which was kind of unusual. They, they usually picked a British person and just sent him over there for a good make work job. Right. Um, Gage was actually in London in 1773. He was returning home for the first time in probably a couple of decades um, uh, to deal with some family business and some other things. Uh, so he was in London when word arrived of the Boston Tea Party. And he was very instrumental in advising the King and Lord North on what steps to take next. And he was of the opinion that we need to get tough. Uh, I think the, the, the quote he used, which I won't get quite right, was, you know, if we act like lambs, they will act like lions. And if we act like lions, they will act like lambs. Uh, in other words, we have to be tough. We have to show them who's boss. And we've been way too lenient with the colonists. We have to, you know, really clamp down on them. And so the, the folks in London bought that and said, yeah, you're absolutely right, Tom. We're going to send you over to Boston. Mm -hmm. We're going to make you not only the military commander of North America, but the governor of Massachusetts. And you're going to implement all of the intolerable acts. Of course, the British didn't call them intolerable, but we certainly did later. Very um, tolerable in Britain. <laughs> yeah, they, they they were quite ready to tolerate them. Uh, they they closed Boston Harbor. They they ended the right to hold town meetings. They were no longer allowed to elect the um, upper chamber of the legislature. Uh, a whole bunch of basically punitive acts to punish the out of control mob in in Boston that had destroyed all this tea. And this is our way of you know really slamming them down and saying, hey, this is just unacceptable. And if you're gonna do this stuff, we're gonna we're gonna smack you down. Well it's really so, fascinating to me uh that you know you have someone like Benjamin Franklin in London at the time who obviously was not as radical yet as he would be, but you know saying this is what our complaints are. Maybe you should listen to their the colonists complaints. So you have a born and raised colonist who's been in London 20 years and hasn't been in North America. And then you have a born and raised Englishman who has been in North America for 20 years and they decide to go with the guy who's actually been there. I just, yeah. well, I, I just that dawned on me while you're talking. I find that fascinating that they would go with his professional opinion over the likes of someone like uh, Benjamin Franklin or any of the other agents who were not well, necessarily. I think, that, I think Gage's position was widely shared. It's not like he convinced them all that this had to be done. Oh, the yeah. King and Lord North and, and Germain and people like that were had been saying the same thing for years. That, oh, certainly. Gage basically saying, I'm on board with this. We got to do something. Right, right. But uh, yeah, but the something that they did was uh, harsh. <laughs> Yeah, it did so, not go over particularly well. No, of course not. So so Gage returns to North America. He goes to Boston uh, and starts implementing these things. Uh, and he is in charge, spoiler alert, when uh, Lexington and Concord breaks out. Yeah, when he actually comes to Boston, he's kind of greeted as a hero. Everybody's so sick of, um, of, of, the, of the previous governor, Hutchinson, that um, they think, oh, this guy's going to change things. And then he comes in and just really lays down the heavy hand and says, yeah, no, we're shutting down all trade in Boston. Um, you're not getting away with anything. You're not holding any more town meetings. I'm going to do all this stuff to you. Yeah. Um, you and, think and that's bad. <laughs> he actually um, moved his government out of Boston into a smaller town, uh, a little further inland. And um, 
he went to try to shut down a town meeting uh, with a, a few hundred soldiers. And the Massachusetts militia turned out in the thousands and chased away his regulars. And he was like, whoa, this is serious. I didn't realize these guys were going to fight back. Uh, they didn't actually fire shots, but they, they intimidated him and made him run back to Boston and hide. They weren't lambs. Um, yeah, no, they were not lambs. Yeah. So he started sending reports back to London saying, you know, send more guns, send more soldiers, send more of everything, because yeah. we're going to need everything you can throw at these guys. And he was basically saying half measures will not do. It'll only embolden them. It'll, you know, it's like poking the bear. You don't poke the bear. You're either nice to him or you kill him. There's no in between here. Right. Um, so, yeah, he, he was very eager to do that. Um, he was actually criticized, though, by a lot of officials at the time for being too lenient, for not being aggressive enough with the resources he had. As I said, he did go kind of hide in Boston and um, trying to wait for reinforcements and such. And he was getting messages from Lord Germain, uh, the Secretary of State for American Affairs in London, saying, you got to do something. You got to start, like, you know, arresting Sam Adams and, um, you know, maybe not let them gather these huge collections of cannons and artillery that they're going to be using against us, stuff like that. Um, so, you know, they were basically sending him notes saying, do something, do it now. Come right. on, what are you waiting for? And he wasn't ready to start capturing leaders, but he did think uh, taking down some of the guns was a good idea. And he'd actually already done several other powder raids where he'd captured um, community gunpowder that was held by local militias. And right. So he that's essentially to... what, uh, sorry to interrupt, but that's essentially what leads to the outbreak of the war, these gunpowder raids. Yeah. I mean, when he goes, you know, first they go up to uh, Portsmouth, New Hampshire, where they raid William and Mary, and the Patriots fight back. We always forget, Paul Revere took a ride to Portsmouth first, <laughs> and he warned them the British were coming, although, of course, didn't say that. Uh, and they, there wasn't a lot of violence, but they fought back and took the powder and cannon. And then several months later, well, the British also go to uh, Lexington and then maybe some Concord. And... <laughs> right. Well, yeah, he had, he had captured some other powder magazines in, in Massachusetts, and he heard that there was a large cache of weapons in, um, in Concord and decided to send a large unit out to get them. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, J.L. Bell, but he uh, wrote a whole book on the fact that the uh, locals had stolen a couple of cannons right out from under his nose in Boston, and he thought those cannons were in in Concord, which is one reason he was really eager to get them back. Right. Um, so yeah, he sent out a bunch of guys to go, you know, on a search and destroy mission to take out whatever artillery and stuff they could find, and um, it did not go well for the British. <laughs> No, and that brings us basically to the thumbnail of this video uh, where we said how he was George Washington's first rival. And we did speak a little bit about how he and Washington had, I don't want to say a relationship, but were acquaintances from years past. Uh, and, and Gage had actually recommended Washington for a commission in the regular army. It was not acted on positively, but he knew he knew him well enough to do that. Yeah, and and that's a big deal for a colonist. You yeah, generally didn't hear that happening. Although you know, it did. <laughs> not usually. Uh, it speaks to Washington's not only skill but reputation by that point. Um, and General Gage is still hanging on to Boston when the revolution breaks out. Kind of gets cornered by Artemis Ward in this makeshift army that <laughs> kind of coalesces around Boston, and then George Washington shows up. So. What do, we, what do we see happen once Washington gets there? Well, even before Washington gets there, um, the, the siege of Boston starts basically the night of Lexington and Concord. They, 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 you know, they're shooting up the, the retreating British the whole way back. And, and as soon as the British get into Boston or, or actually Charleston um, and collapse, they surround the city. And Artemis Ward immediately becomes the commander of what's called the New England Army. And... Um, they're trying to figure out what to do next. Uh, shortly after that, uh, three new generals arrive in Boston who had already been sent before word of, of all this uh, arrived back in London. But um, we get General Howe, uh, Clinton, Henry Clinton, and um, Johnny Burgoyne all arriving on the same ship together to assist Gage. 
with this mess in Boston. And the first thing they say is, well, we just, we've already given up Charlestown, which is the peninsula just to the north of Boston. Uh, we need to take that back. And we also need to take the Heights south of Boston back. Um, and they're actually planning an attack. Both of those heights were kind of no man's land. The British basically told the Americans, if you try to take that land, we're just going to smash you. And so both sides kind of stayed off the list. Uh, For a while. British, well, the British then decided to, to take the, uh, the heights to the south. And the Americans got word of that. And so they immediately ran in and took Bunker Hill and Breed's Hill and built the defenses there. And of course, Gage ordered General Howe then to take Bunker Hill back, and he did, but again, that did not go terribly well. He no, was, yeah, you know, it was a success, a whole lot of kind of. And thank you for bringing that up. I, I should not have skipped Bunker Hill and gone right to George Washington. I was too eager. Right. Can I ask so, you, so when uh, Howe and Clinton and, and Burgoyne, and, and I should say Admiral Howe, General Howe's brother, uh, when they all show up, who's actually in charge of the British Army in North America at that point? Is it still Gage? It is still Gage. Gage is the senior commander. Um, and Admiral Howe wasn't there quite yet. There was another admiral still in charge who Gage actually hated. And the two of them did not get along at all together. Um, but when word of Bunker Hill reached London uh, about six weeks after the fact, uh, London decided that's it. Uh, you're, you're coming home. Um, so they sent word back to Gage that he needed to get on the next boat back to London. Now, while that was all happening, um, George Washington did come up and take command. Uh, George Washington was appointed the new general of this new Continental Army uh, a week or two before Bunker Hill, but he didn't actually get there until after the battle. Right. Um, so Washington and Gage were looking at each other eyeball to eyeball for July, August, September. I think Gage went home sometime in that, that fall. Um, so that, yeah, they were there for a few months together and, and it was interesting. Washington never attempted to contact Gage uh, during those months. Um, he thought it would be improper because the two men did have a relationship and having communications with the enemy might look inappropriate. Right. So the, the two men never actually spoke with each other or communicated in any way. It was a sticky situation, that. as they say. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and so I understand now, if memory serves me correctly, they did, I don't know, I, was it Gage? Someone did try and contact Washington, but they didn't refer to him as general. Is that, but it, that might not have been Gage. That might have been later on. That happened in New York. That was General Howe. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I apologize. Trying to keep it all together. <laughs> Again, I spent a lot of time on Americans, and this is the first time we're deep diving on a uh, not so American. So Gage leaves Boston. Does he return to the North America? Uh, no, I don't think he ever comes back to North America. Uh, his career is pretty much over at that point. Um, well, good riddance. <laughs> yeah, he, uh, um, as I said, he was, he was older than Washington. I think he was born in 1719. So he was in his 50s by then, which for, for a military man, that's kind of the end of most of their careers. Um, you know, they may do some stuff in, um, he didn't go to parliament, but often, oftentimes people would, would end up with a job in government or something like that. Uh, he did get one last promotion, and that was thanks to his brother dying uh, without issue. And he became, uh, he inherited his older brothers and fathers lands and title and he became the Viscount Gage um, during the 17, late 1770s, 1780s. Uh, and he also did receive a promotion, um, I believe in 1782, to full general, what we would call a four star general today. Excellent. Fascinating. Well, Great. I should note before when I was making a joke and saying good riddance, I do try and stay objective on this channel. <laughs> I'm not really uh, angry at the British anymore. That's in the past. <laughs>
he made room for General Howe to take command, and, and right. General Howe was also a pushover for Washington, so it worked out well. Yeah, there we go. Uh, it did work out well. That's inter- that's an interesting thing to speculate on. Obviously, we'd never know, but that's a big what if. What if he hung around and kept uh, his attentions on the little hostility in North America? <laughs> no wonder. I mean, he had that experience, although... As you said, his problem was getting enough troops to actually carry out what he was hoping would happen, right? Yeah, you got to remember, he only had uh, a couple of thousand soldiers. It was not a lot. I mean, he was really heavily outnumbered in Boston. If the Americans had, you know, had any gunpowder, they might have been able to actually do something. <laughs> but right. uh, so, yeah, he, he was really outnumbered. He was the one who was sending letters to London saying, you know, if you think 10,000 men is enough, send 20,000. We just, right. we really need them. And they did send 20,000, more than that. They sent almost 50,000 uh, the next year, but they gave them all to General Howe, his successor, to, uh, you know, use the shock and all and crush the enemy whole thing. Right. Too little, too late. Well, that, yeah, that's going to be another conversation. Oh, yeah, exactly. And our time is running, of course, today. But Michael, thank you so much for being here. You will obviously be coming back to chat with us. And everyone else will obviously be going to the link below to listen to the entirety of the American Revolution podcast. So thank you for being here. Thanks. It's been a pleasure. Absolutely. Founder fans, just a reminder, like I said, link in the description below. I just finally caught up after several years of listening. I highly recommend it all of the American Revolution podcast, but specifically, Michael just recently put out an episode about Silas Dean and how he was essentially a martyr to the American cause, though not killed, just his, how do you say, uh, uh, popularity was martyred to the American cause. So check that out, and I'll be back with another founder for you tomorrow.